One thing most of the hard anthracite coal railroads had in common in their early diesel years were their black or lack of colored locomotives. As the second generation of the diesel locomotives came in, many began to brighten up their liveries with an array of color schemes. Roads like the Delaware and Hudson with its dark blue and later dynamic lightning stripe blue and gray, the Redding's dark green and later green and yellow, including the rare Beeline service slogan on the sides, and the eccentric Lehigh Valley whose exotic and varied paint schemes seemingly sampled every color from the rainbow. All of that changed in 1976 when every railroad's color became blue, and that's including our beloved d &H. My earliest train memories captured a little bit of Conrail in its early state of being, a collection of deteriorated track and locomotives from various bankrupt Northeast railroads. Conrail's dress blue paint scheme had yet to displace the various paint schemes of the bankrupt carriers that were brought under the Conrail umbrella, the largest component of which was the Penn Central with its black locomotives, hence what became known as Conrail's black and blue years. The Penn Central was the biggest component of Conrail, and indeed, Conrail was set up to be little more than a big blue Penn Central, but with good track and equipment and without those pesky competitors siphoning away all of its traffic. Conrail still failed though, losing $1 million per day, just like the Penn Central before it, until the systematic issues were finally addressed. The Jersey Central, as it was usually called, contributed some important secondary lines and industrial trackage to Conrail. But its main lines were commuter traffic heavy, and Conrail offloaded them to the New Jersey Transit, keeping trackage rights for any freight access. If you're not familiar with the New Jersey Transit, it's New Jersey's State Surface Transportation Agency that absorbed the operation of commuter trains on various New Jersey rail lines that were originally part of the Conrail system. The Erie Lackawanna was a last minute addition to Conrail after the original plan to have another profitable railroad acquire the EL fell through due to the organized labor's refusal to make concessions on work rules, that railroad being the Chessy system. Conrail from day one viewed and treated the Erie Lackawanna as surplus, abandoning much of its main lines and diverting traffic wherever possible to alternate, usually ex Penn Central routes. A notable exception was the Southern Tier line across New York State, which the state encouraged the retention of by offering financial assistance to Conrail to fix up track and signals. This line also figured prominently in the alternative fig leaf of competition provided for the essential rail monopoly for the ports of New York and Boston created by the birth of Conrail, that being the expansion of the Delaware and Hudson via extensive trackage rights. Van Etten Junction on the Lehigh Valley Railroad was located just south of the little town of Van Etten, New York. The Lehigh Valley Main Line pushed north, railroad west, from Sayre to the junction where the freight main veered off to the northwest, railroad west, to Geneva and the passenger main veered off to the northeast, also railroad west, toward Ithaca, New York. Both lines were in place and in use by the Lehigh Valley until Conrail was formed in 1976. The freight main to Geneva was immediately abandoned by Conrail. In fact, I don't believe that Conrail ever actually operated a single regular train over that line. Whether it did or not, the tracks were torn up immediately after 1976. The freight route sought easier grades before the freight and passenger routes rejoined again at the Geneva Junction. Moving further west after Rochester Junction, the valley crossed the B&O at p &L Junction where there was also a connection with the old New York Central Peanut Line. Depew was a junction with the Branch to Suspension Bridge which is where the Lehigh Valley operated the Maple Leaf between New York and Toronto, Canada. Moving back to Van Etten, the passenger main is still in place between the old junction and Ithaca, New York, and it also extends north of Ithaca to the power plant there. This line was still in use by the Norfolk Southern in 2018, which brings us to the main subject of this video. That portion of the Lehigh Valley's former Ithaca branch that was formerly operated by Norfolk Southern is now operated by the new Ithaca Central Railroad, which is a newly formed subsidiary of the short line operator Watco. On November 8, 2018, a filing was made with the Surface Transportation Board where Watco had requested an exemption that allowed the Ithaca Central to operate as a Class 3 railroad on approximately 48.8 miles of track between Sarah, Pennsylvania and Lansing, New York, which is just north of Ithaca. Tracks were first laid by the Geneva, Ithaca, and Sarah in 1875 and later became part of the Lehigh Valley Railroad. 
The current main customers are the Cargill Salt Plant in Lansing and a Waverly company that receives plastic pellets. The agreement extends about four miles beyond Ithaca to the troubled Cayuga power plant. The coal-burning power plant was steeped in controversy for years as the new owners had spent years unsuccessfully seeking approval to convert it to natural gas. Don't know if they've been successful yet or not. At the time, the 325 megawatt generating station was one of just two coal plants still operating in New York, where state government was working to end all coal-fired power generation by 2020. The Ithaca Central was the 40th railroad in the stable of Kansas-based Watco, a non-operating holding company which, at the time, controlled at least 38 Class 3 short lines as well as the Class 2 Wisconsin and Southern. We're here at American Rock Salt, which is located within the yard limits of Taylor. I've said in past videos that it's rare for the salt spur to be devoid of any rail cars, loaded or empty. Today, it's the day after Christmas, December 26, 2014, and we've just arrived as the local switching crew, which I believe was symbol the D11 at the time, is pulling the empties from the spur. Once clear of the main line switch, the Canadian Pacific Jeep shoves the cars past the power switch at control point 672 and proceeds south onto the Taylor siding, which today is part of the Taylor yard limit, and into Taylor yard where the empties will move north on the next Binghamton bound train 259, where they'll probably be handed off to the Norfolk Southern to move west over the Southern Tier Line to the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad and their salt mines in Retsoff, New York. During business hours, the day-to-day -day unloading operations happening at American Rock Salt is a pretty interesting procedure to watch. First, various mobile conveyors are moved into position for the proper distribution of the salt. Once in position, the salt is bottom dumped from the loaded covered hoppers where it travels across the conveyor belt pipeline and is dropped into place in large mounds where a payloader smooths out the top before the salt is tarped with the protection from rain, snow, and other man-made and non-man-made elements. Perhaps even more interesting than watching the unloading of the salt cars is watching the movement of them. At least it was interesting back in 2015. Although the salt spur is located within the Taylor yard limits, the railroad does not provide individual car spotting services to the business. When individual cars need to be spotted into position, that assignment was the task of another earth mover which gently walks the cars into position for unloading and eventual pickup. Somewhere between 2015 when I recorded these scenes and 2020 when I took these photos, the earth moving machines were replaced by a somewhat automated car moving system. A thick steel cable attached to a giant winch on one end, an attachment piece on the other end that's wound around a large pulley. So now when a car or multiple cars need to be brought into position, a new winch and pulley system does the job once accomplished by rubber tires and diesel power. Another metal marvel that I caught while on the spur is the southbound Binghamton, New York to Enola, Pennsylvania daily. Train 11Z, now under Norfolk Southern ownership, is making its daily descent behind a DC Jeevo, an AC Jeevo, and a soon-to-be rebuilt Dash 9. And while you're watching this long train pass by, take note of the green Bay Line high top gondola, about 20 to 30 cars behind the locomotives, and the double stack waste containers in the middle a portent of things to come in the days, months, and years ahead. And a little disclaimer, I apologize for the awful wind noise as this train is rolling by. At the time, I did not have a windscreen for my microphone, so what you hear is unfortunately what you get.
We started this salty little adventure at the new American rock salt deposit in Taylor, but a few videos back you learned that it was on the site of the former Pennsylvania Railroad Buttonwood Yard where my rail fan adventures in the Northeast started. That's also where American Rockstar got its start too. At least I think it was. While I can't say exactly when they took up roots in Buttonwood, I can remember the salt man being in Buttonwood as far back as the 1990s. Whenever it was that they arrived, in 2004 they greatly expanded their operations in Buttonwood. It was a dual operation back then, salt and scrap. American rock salt on one side and the DMS scrap metal shredder on the other. The salt deposit received inbound loaded covered hoppers just like they do today, while the shredder received inbound empty gondola cars that were loaded with the scrap metal pieces. And just like up at Taylor in 2015, the cars were spotted about the siding with the payloader. These photos that I took 20 years ago in 2004 show the new scales that had just been put in. Note that the ballast hasn't even been dropped yet. Also in this photo, you can see the gross weight display in the upper left corner. This scale weighed empty and loaded gondola cars. Also visible from these photos is the swing out gate that the payloader used to come out and push the cars into position. And one last thing to point out about this scale is that locomotives were never allowed on it. Now we take a look at the inbound and outbound truck scale located at American Rock Salt in Taylor Yard today. Similar to the rail car scale at Buttonwood, this scale weighs the inbound empty trucks and then again once they're loaded and outbound. Cargill de-icing technology operates one of its three mines in Lansing, New York providing customers with de-icing technology and road salt that saves lives, enhances commerce, and reduces environmental impact. Cargill acquired the mine in 1970 and annually produces approximately 2 million tons of road salt that is shipped to more than 1,500 locations throughout New York State and the Northeast United States. In 1915, John Clute organized the Rock Salt Corporation on Portland Point in Lansing. In 1916, the shaft was sunk to 1,500 feet, but the salt was of poor quality. By 1918, the mine was still not producing well and was shut down. In 1921, Frank Bolton and John Shannon bought the mine and further sank the shaft to 2,000 feet to a better vein of salt, which was 99% pure. The operation was managed by Frank Bolton and then his wife Lucy when he passed away. The Cayuga Rock Salt Company managed the Cayuga mine until 1970 when Cargill purchased the mining rights. Cargill modernized the mine with new belt lines for salt haulage, ventilation updates, a new shaft, and new diesel-powered equipment. Currently, the mine is advancing north up Cayuga Lake and is approximately a mile east past Tughannock Point. The salt is mainly sold in the road de-icing market, but is also sold under the Diamond Crystal name as residential de-icing salt. The Finger Lakes region are a group of 11 long, narrow, roughly north-south lakes located directly south of Lake Ontario in an area called the Finger Lakes region in New York. This region straddles the northern and transitional edge of the northern Allegheny Plateau, known as the Finger Lakes Uplands and Gorges ecoregion and the Ontario Lowlands ecoregion of the Great Lakes Lowlands. The geological term Finger Lakes refers to a long, narrow lake in an over and glacial valley, while the proper name Finger Lakes goes back to the late 19th century. Cayuga and Seneca Lakes are among the deepest in the United States, measuring 435 feet and 618 feet respectively with bottoms well below sea level. Though none of the lakes widths exceed 3.5 miles, Seneca Lake is 38.1 miles long and at 66.9 square miles is the largest in total area. The Ithaca Central Railroad reporting mark, ITHR, is a 48.8 mile long short line railroad operating in New York and Pennsylvania that's owned by Watco. The Ithaca Central leases and operates the Norfolk Southern owned Ithaca Secondary from Sarah, Pennsylvania, which is the Norfolk Southern interchange, to Ludlowville, New York. The railroad began operations on December 8, 2018, serving its primary customer, the Cargill Cayuga Rock Salt Mine in Lansing, New York, although the railroad can haul various commodities such as salt, coal, plastics, and magnesium chloride. The railroad uses two ex-Union Pacific EMD SD40-2 SD45 car body locomotives 
WAMX numbers 4247 and WAMX numbers 4248. On January 30, 2019, the Ithaca Central received a third EMD SD40-2, WAMX 4241. One unique characteristic that immediately jumped out at me on the leading dash 2 are those DeFasco flexi-coil trucks. DeFasco trucks are commonly found on Elko and Montreal Locomotive Works diesels of Canadian heritage, such as those on our local Delaware Lackawanna short line. When I arrived in Ithaca, the crew had not yet come on duty, so I ventured further north to Lansing to get shots of the salt mine. And wouldn't you know it, as I was making my way south back into town, here came the Ithaca Central northbound on its way to where I just came from, which empties to be loaded up with more salt. When I got back to home base, I was greeted to the nightly evening local switcher switching out of all places the American Rock Salt Spur. Notable is the power, an EMD AC powered locomotive and a Dash 944 CW that's well on its way to becoming one. The trailing locomotive number 9216 has a unique place along on our journey. Can you remember when it showed up a few videos back? If not, here's a little refresher for you. You remember this locomotive, don't you? She was built in April of 1998 as the DC Propulsion-940 CW number 9216 and rebuilt as the AC Propulsion C6M that we see here more than 20 years later in March of 2021. Today, she's being assisted by the 9928, a 944CW that will soon be rebuilt into a C6M and an SD60E a Norfolk Southern exclusive locomotive that was rebuilt from an EMD SD60, likely dead in tow. The Norfolk Southern switching crew performs the same switching maneuvers that we saw Canadian Pacific doing the day after Christmas almost 10 years ago back in 2014. And while the power may change, the people may change, and in today's case, even the railroad has changed. The work of freight trains moving ice-melting crystals to market remains a salty endeavor. <laughs> 